Okay, we'll get started in just a moment. Okay, hi everybody. This is Danielle Karapkin speaking to you from Thornhill, Ontario for webyeshiva.org. And let me just move my, there we go. Um, we are continuing along in our study of the Guide for the Perplexed by the Rambam, by Maimonides, Moren of Uchim. Um, and we are <clears throat> going to be studying two chapters today, chapters three and four. We're starting in the Pines edition on page 422. Um, uh, and uh, we are continuing along in a very esoteric analysis of Maasei Merkava, the act of the chariot, as it appears in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, the chapters one and two, uh, we had looked at primarily the verses from Ezekiel chapter one, which is the first depiction of the chariot or of these chayot and ofanim that Ezekiel has a vision of, these angelic beings. Um, up until now, what the Rambam has informed us is that uh, if we look carefully at the words, we will discover that these are descriptive of the system of metaphysics um, using an Aristotelian model of science about how God's emanation comes into our world and gives rise to all of reality in our sublunar uh, terrestrial existence via the celestial spheres. This is classic Aristotelian science, and the Rambam reads that scientific model in the Maase Merkava, in the vision of Yecheskel, and he feels that it's important for every Jew to have some familiarity with this in order to become closer to God. The more familiar we are with the workings of the universe, the closer to God we become. Now we're going to be continuing uh, in ch two short chapters today, chapter three and chapter four, uh, in which we're going to discover that Ezekiel has a second vision of the chariot. The Rambam had already told us about this second vision. It's in chapter 10 of the book of Ezekiel. And we're gonna select certain passages from there. And for the sake of brevity and just pr presenting uh, our ideas as concisely as possible, I'm going to share my screen with you uh, that's going to give us an outline of what's going on together with some of the verses. Um, and what I want to point out is that Ezekiel makes it clear that he's having this vision um, while in a state of, in his visionary experience, he finds himself being transported to Jerusalem. Um, and what that essentially means is is that, uh, as the Rambam had stated to us back in section two, um, the Rambam had taught us in the chapter 46 of section two, that many times a prophet will have a visionary experience of being tr transported to a certain place. But it doesn't mean that he actually is in that place, but that God is showing him that he's bringing him to a certain place in order to have a vision. So it says in Ezekiel chapter eight, verse three, that God brought me to Jerusalem in a vision of God. To the opening of the inner gate that faces north. And there was a, 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 an object of idolatry that was the source of upset for God. Now, there's a lot of visionary experience that Ezekiel has between there and between when we get to Ezekiel chapter 10, but that is really the set up verse that indicates that this is a continuation of that visionary experience that Ezekiel is having in his mind in Jerusalem. He's not physically in Jerusalem, but in his mind, he's been transported to Jerusalem. And that's really the only, uh, or that's really the primary difference between this visionary experience and the visionary experience that he has in chapter one, where scripture describes it as being adjacent to Nahar Kivar, the Kavar River, wherever that is. Now, um, as we point out, the Rambam tells us that the purpose of this vision in chapter 10 is to portray the influence of the spheres on creation, but in a more advanced and complex state. That's going to be what we're going to work with, even though the Rambam doesn't say that explicitly, 
but it certainly seems from the way that the Shem Tov interprets the Rambam that the only difference between this vision and Ezekiel uh, and, and Ezekiel's vision in chapter one is that we're seeing more of an interaction between the celestial spheres bringing rise to more complex um, organisms and reality within our sublunary realm. So he's transported to Jerusalem, but not physically. And I apologize when I was writing this, I didn't have the text in front of me. So, but it is in, in chapter 46 on page 404 in the Pines edition, if you wanted to reference back to that idea of being transported in a vision. And we might suggest, and this is my own suggestion, that the reason why he's having a vision in Jerusalem, that represents a sense of completion and creation. Whereas the events at Nahar Kavar are at a preliminary unfinished state. The idea of Jerusalem is that you've finally arrived, is that you've gotten to the place where you need to get to. And therefore, it seems that whereas in Ezekiel chapter one, there is a preliminary account of how the celestial spheres give rise to prime matter. And prime matter, like we've talked like we talked about before, that's the sort of primordial uh, formless matter that first comes into existence and then br branches off into the four elements. We spoke about that last week um, as sort of the Aristotelian model of our planet being surrounded by four round layers of earth, water, wind, and then fire. And those four elements are emanated from the prime matter and that prime matter is emanated from the celestial spheres. And so perhaps we're going to see a more complex interaction with our sublunary realm from the celestial spheres. And the reason why that's depicted as being in Jerusalem is because Jerusalem means that we've arrived, we've come to the, the most contemporary place where we need to be. Whereas in chapter one, it was more of a preliminary explanation of the origins of cosmogony and its influence on our planet. Here we get to a more sophisticated um, discussion of more developed organisms. Next, Ezekiel teaches us seven new things about the heavenly system in chapter 10 that were not taught previously in chapter one. That's what the Rambam says he sees. He finds seven things. Um, in chapter 10, Ezekiel refers to the chayot, the celestial spheres, as keruvim. It's one of the major changes is that if you look at the text, you'll notice that the word keruvim is used instead of chayot. Uh, Behold, I had a vision, and there were four ofanim, which uh, in the previous chapter, the Rambam had explained to us that the word ofanim is a, even though it means wheels, it really is a reference to the elements that are spawned from the celestial spheres. The chayot were, is what was referenced as the celestial spheres. The four chayot are the four celestial globes, which contain all of the celestial spheres that emanate into our planet. But here they're called keruvim. The Rambam doesn't say why. And as, the, and as we mentioned last time, the Rambam is deliberately remaining somewhat cryptic because he feels a duty to not reveal too much overtly. Uh, the Shem Tov says, why was the name changed from Chayot to Keruvim? He offers two possibilities. The word Keruvim is a jumble of the word Rechuvim, which means those beings that are ridden upon. And that means that there are separate intellects in Aristotelian science that control the motion of the celestial spheres. It's as if we wanted to portray the celestial spheres as being um, uh, like beasts that are ridden upon by their riders, these, in, uh, these uh, disembodied intellects that cause their motion, that sentience that causes the spheres to move. That's one explanation, keruvim rechuvim. Another explanation is that the idea of keruvim means that they possess human intellect because in the vision of Ezekiel chapter one, we noted, and, and also in, in, in chapter 10, we note that one of the faces is that of a child, and the face of a child represents human intellect. And so that's descriptive of sentient celestial spheres, and that's the reason why Ezekiel in chapter 10 
uh, imparts to them this idea of sentience. Um, he calls the Ofanim by the term Hagalgal, that's point number two, which we haven't seen before in chapter one. But here the Ofanim are called Hagalgal, which simply means that the Ofanim moved in a circular motion, and this will be the topic of chapter four, which we'll get to momentarily. The also Another point that we find in chapter 10 is this emphasis on the idea of lo yisabu belechtam, the Ofanim did not deviate from their trajectory. That is, although we saw previously in chapter one that the Ofanim are the elements that are tethered to the celestial spheres. And if you recall the analogy of the Rambam in chapter two, he said that the Ofanim, the, which represent the elements that are spawned from the celestial spheres, the celestial spheres possess sentience and motion, whereas the elements are inanimate do not possess any kind of sentience whatsoever, and are therefore being schlepped along, as it were, if you'll pardon my French, they're being dragged along and moved by the celestial spheres, just as if an animal had a stone tied to its leg, the stone would move together with the legs, the animal's leg as it walked. Their movement was not yet depicted as being completely orchestrated by the spheres and completely unwavering, so this is a stronger emphasis on the idea that the elements do not have any kind of independence whatsoever other than the motion of the celestial spheres. And if you'll recall, the motion of the elements that is caused by the spheres is what gives rise to various compound uh, uh, substances that where different elements combine to form different kinds of organisms in our world. Another, uh, number four, is that in chapter one, the vision only depicted the Ofanim's backs or torsos, depending as how you define the word gabot, as being full of eyes. But now, however, the entire body of the Ofanim, including their flesh, hands, and wings, are also depicted as being full of eyes in, in Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 12. This indicates a further process of elemental combination to produce more sophisticated compound creatures that is, those with eyes. And if you recall from last week's discussion, the word enayim, or eyes, uh, could have meant several different things. But one thing is clear that for the Rambam, the word enayim means some kind of organism that is a product of com the combination of elements to give rise to com some kind of complex organism. In the same vein, the Ophanim in chapter 1, and this is difference number 5, had only been depicted as bodies, but not possessing flesh, hands, and wings. Now, however, the vision describes a richer form of creation where more organisms have come into existence, including living organisms with more form, that Aristotelian term, including all of these components, such as flesh, hands, and wings. So it's descriptive of how the elements really combine with each other and produce not only simple uh, complex structures such as rocks and plants, but also animals and human beings as well. All of that comes about in our planet through the combination of different elements that are combined through the mo motion of the celestial spheres. Uh, difference number six, in chapter 10, each ofan is described as having its unique karuv that it was assigned to. This indicates that each element is moved by a unique celestial force. It's not clear why Ezekiel found it more important to, exp to explain that in chapter 10, but it probably has to do with the same thing thematically, that it's descriptive of a more complex system where every, every movement is orchestrated by a separate mover. And finally, the seventh difference is that in chapter 10, uh, the prophet describes the Karuvim in the plural as being Chaya in the singular. This indicates that despite there being a multiplicity of set celestial forces, they unify as one celestial force being responsible for motion. Now, according to the Shem Tov, this is descriptive of the one celestial globe that contains all of the star spheres within it. And here's where I want to just remind you, just a very quick review of something that I had encouraged you to review uh, before starting this whole section, which is section two of the guide, chapter nine. And in there, the Rambam had told us that there are 
uh, uh, there are things called celestial globes. And the difference between a celestial globe and a celestial sphere is that a sphere is two-dimensional. It's completely flat without any thickness. And it simply is a, a um, transparent sphere in which is embedded celestial bodies. A celestial globe, and that's a different word in Arabic, is where uh, the Rambam is describing a series of celestial spheres that are all in contact with each other, stacked upon each other within a set of, of um, within like one unit, and that's called a globe. So it has, it's a three-dimensional um, uh, celestial sphere because it contains multiple spheres. Now, as we explained in chapter nine, back in section two, the Rambam had actually deliberately changed the order of the planets from what he had originally ordered them in Mishneh Torah. And this is sort of, as Gad Freudenthal in an article that is often quoted points out, the Rambam in his Mishneh Torah, in his codification of Aristotel the Aristotelian order of the cosmos, tells us that there are nine celestial spheres. And he lists them, just, the, I have this in front of you in the text, it's from chapter three of Hilchot Yesodei HaTorah Halacha Aleph, the Rambam writes, Vehem tisha galgalim. There are nine celestial spheres. The closest sphere to us is the moon sphere. The sphere that's directly above the moon sphere is the Mercury sphere called Kochav. That which is above it is called Noga, Venus. And that which is above that is called the sun sphere, uh, Chama. The, the, the one above that is Mars. The one above that is Jupiter. The one about, above that is Shabtai or Saturn. Now, in order to um, organize the spheres correctly, the Rambam actually in Moren Vuchim changes the order of the planetary spheres. Because if you look carefully, you'll discover that the order is Moon, then Mercury, then Venus, then the Sun, then Mars, then Jupiter, and then Saturn. It's not that different from the way that astronomers um, uh, classify the distance of the planets from the sun, except the sun is inserted in the middle. The Rambam changed the order in Morena Vuchim. He said the first sphere is the moon sphere, the one just above the moon sphere is the sun sphere, and then the five planetary spheres of Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are all grouped together above the sun sphere. And then above that are all of the stars that are not planets. And that also contains a, that's a planetary globe containing all of the star, different celestial spheres containing stars. The reason why the Rambam did that is because the prophet Ezekiel describes there as only being four chayot. And if the Rambam's thesis is correct, that the chayot are a reference to the celestial uh, structure, so then he has to create a system whereby nine spheres, which is the Aristotelian model, fits in to the four spheres that are described by Ezekiel in chapter one. He does that by grouping all the planets together in one, in one what we would call a globe, a grouping of, or, or a cluster of spheres, and then above that, a cluster of star spheres, and, that is, and with that, he's able to condense nine uh, celestial spheres into four. Okay, and this is really According to the Shem Tov, he, he theorizes that perhaps this is what the Rambam means over here when he says that the prophet in chapter 10 refers to kruvim, which is a word in the plural, he refers it to a chaya to sort of imply that within one chaya, within one celestial body, there could be multiple spheres. So it's plural, but it's also singular. Okay. In addition to, to addressing the chaya in the singular, Ezekiel had also identified the Ophanim in the singular back in chapter one, and the Rambam just says this seemingly parenthetically, indicating that initially all the four elements were unified as prime matter. So it, it, it seems like the Rambam is indicating that even though there's a, plur, a plurality to creation, both in the cosmos and in this terrestrial realm as well, nonetheless, the prophet switches back and forth between using a plural designation to, uh, versus a singular designation. It could be like the Shem Tov said regarding the celestial bodies to indicate that the Rambam has grouped a cluster together, but it also seems that he's trying to 
portray for us that really anything that is a plurality in this ver in this world that we are able to study originates from a unity and because why because god is the ultimate unity and so from god initially spawns unity and that unity branches off into a plurality that's generally the way things work and it's a certainly a neoplatonist way of descri describing how emanations come from god now that really concludes chapter three let's jump into quickly chapter four and we title this chapter yonatan ben uziel's error now we know that yonatan ben uziel was a student of the great tana hillel lives many centuries before the rambam and so for the rambam to say that yonatan ben uziel made a mistake in his translation of a portion of scripture because Yonatan ben Uziel, according to the Talmud, had a translation of all of uh, had all, uh, of all of the Nevi'im, all of the books of the prophets. The rabbis even tell us that Yonatan ben Uziel was so brilliant and insightful in understanding of the uh, biblical text that he wanted to uh, create a translation of the book of Daniel, but God did not allow him to because he would have revealed too many esoteric secrets to the world. But he, apparently, even though Ezekiel and the story of the chariot is also filled with esoteric secrets, there was not the same level of concern for Yonatan ben Uziel to translate the book of Ezekiel, including the vision of the Merkava. So here, the Rambam is going to suggest to us that Yonatan ben Uziel, he's doing it in a very subtle way, he never says explicitly, Yonatan ben Uziel is wrong. He doesn't use those words, but it becomes clear that that's where he's going. Now, if we go back to Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 13, which is going to be the, the focus of this chapter, it says, La'afonim lahem korah hagalgal be'oznai, that uh, regarding the ofanim, I heard the word hagalgal being recited in my ears. That's what the prophet states, that he's having this vision of the Ofanim, and he hears the word Hagalgal in his ears as he's having this vision. Now, literally, the word Hagalgal can be translated as a wheel, um, or it can be translated as something round. So he says that Yonatan ben Uziel, when he translated this verse, he defined the Ofanim in question as heavenly spheres, which are usually called Galgalim. We know that in Hebrew, the term galgalim not only means wheels, but it's also a reference to the celestial spheres. As a matter of fact, if you look back at Mishnah Torah, he says, ha-galgalim heimanikreim shamaim verakia uzvul va'aravot. The celestial spheres are have different names, and, he's refer and he says, and there are nine galgalim. So clearly the Rambam himself uses the, words, the word galgal or galgalim to refer to celestial spheres. And he says, and that's way Yonat, the way Yonatan ben Uziel translates the term Galgalim as well. Now, um, uh, Moshe Narboni is a little puzzled where the Rambam extracts that from Yonatan ben Uziel's translation of verse 13. We're not going to go into that right now because the Rambam is really extracting it not just from Yonatan ben Uziel's localized translation of verse 13, but his depiction of the Ofanim in general in a number of places it becomes clear that Yonatan ben Uziel understands the Ofanim as being celestial constructs, as being celestial bodies, and not being the four elements that the Rambam had defined them as being. Okay, and this is really very important for the Rambam because if a metaphysician has to have a clear view of the prophet and a clear interpretation of the prophetic vision of Ezekiel in order to understand the workings of the universe, we are in serious trouble if we follow Yonatan ben Uziel's depiction because it is not an accurate depiction of the workings of the cosmos and how metaphysics influences the physics of our world. So he, he does point out that Yonatan ben Uziel incorrectly um, defined the word hagalgal in reference to the ofanim as being a celestial body, right? Now, another, but, um, uh, another factor that he says brought Yonatan ben Uziel to misidentify the Ofanim was the verse from chapter 1, verse 16, that depicts the Ofanim as having a certain appearance. Because it says in chapter 1 that, Mar'eha Ofanim ke'in tarshish, 
that the Ofanim and their work, their their uh, whatever work was revolving around the Ofanim, um, resembled Tarshish, which is a crystalline stone, a gemstone. Um, and so it seems from Yonatan ben Uziel that he understood when when the when the the verse depicts a the appearance of the Ofan as being like a gemstone, it must have a bright color like the sky or like something heavenly, a crystalline appearance depicting what was at God's feet, for example, in Exodus chapter 24, as it says that the elders, when they were uh, atop Mount Sinai, noticed that beneath God's feet was Kima'ase Livnata Sapir, was like sapphire stone, which apparently Yonatan ben Uziel understands is that if it's directly beneath God's throne, it must be descriptive of some heavenly body that is part of this emanative process. And it was like the, the uh, a purely cleansed sky, pure blue, like a beautiful blue sky. So it, that's another reason to think perhaps that the word ofan is referring to a celestial body. And Rav Kafech points out to the Gemara in Masechet Sota, which says that when a person looks at his tzitzit, He's thinking ultimately about the color of the sky, this Tarshish color, perhaps, that Yonatan ben Uziel is referring to. Now, the mis this misreading of the term Ofan also led Yonatan ben Uziel to mistranslate another phrase from chapter 1, this time verse 15, because it says in that verse, Va'era ha'chayot, that I gazed upon the chayot, v'hine Ofan echad ba'aretz, and behold, there was one ofan on the earth, right? Eitzel hachayot, right adjacent to the chayot, uh, 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 according to their four faces. Now, this verse seems clearly to indicate that the ofanim are part of earth, our terrestrial existence, meaning the elements. And that it was on that basis that the Rambam had explained the Ofanim as being the elements of our planet. But Yonatan ben Uziel translates this to mean that the Ofan was in heaven, but was lower like earth than the other layers of heaven. That's how he understands it. It's part of the celestial structure, but it's a lower celestial construct closer to the earth. That's how he understands the word Ba'aretz, that it's closer to the earth than the other heavenly spheres. Um, so that's really, it's very clear from the totality of Yonatan ben Uziel's work on both chapter 1 and chapter 10 that he understands the Ofanim differently from the Rambam. And the Rambam therefore needs to point out what caused Yonatan ben Uziel to make his error. His mistake was his reading of the word Hagalgal. Here it does not at all mean celestial sphere, but rather something in a circular motion that is round in shape. The word Galgal has multiple meanings, all having to do with something that is round or circular. That this is because Galgal also means something that is rolling in motion, right? You know that famous song, right? Harakevet mistovevet al Galgalim. The train is rolling along on its wheels, right? That's the word Galgalim, okay? And he gives us several examples of where the word Galgal is not a reference to a celestial sphere, but rather is referring to something round that is moving or rolling. The Gilgalticha min hasilaim, God says in Jeremiah, that I will cause you to roll down from the high places. Or when it talks about Jacob rolling off the stone off of the well when he meets uh, Rachel for the first time. Vayagel et ha'even me'al pi ha'be'er, the word vayagel from the word galgal. Or Virudaf, or in Isaiah, Virudaf Kemotz Harim Lifnei Ruach Galgal Lifnei Sufa. In that context, the word Galgal means a tumbleweed, that the Jews will be will roll off the land like a tumbleweed because the land will be desolate and just the wind will blow them away. And so it's clear that it's all of these are examples of where the word Galgal just means something that's in motion and that is round. And that's the reason why the word gulgolet, which is also derivative of the word galgal, means a skull, because it is it has a spherical shape. The celestial spheres are called galgalim because they are round and they are in a circular motion. Fate is called galgal hachoser, the wheel of fortune, which is not just a phrase from the 6th century philosopher, Christian philosopher Boethius, but it's contained in the Talmud as well. 
Our sages tell us that the reason why we're supposed to eat something round at a shiva house, at a house of mourning, is because life is a galgal hachoser. It is a circle or a wheel that keeps coming back. The idea being is that what happens to one person one day, the, the wheel will roll and it'll occur to another person another day. Everyone goes through a period of mourning in their lives, invariably, and that's the way why life is re, is called, or you know, like the song "Circle of Life." It's the same idea. That it's these are all references to the word galgal, and therefore here too, describing the ophanim as hagalgal simply means that they are circular in form. And if you go back to our illustration that we provided last week those four different layers surrounding our planet are all circular and are all in motion because they're being moved in a circular motion by the Chayot. And they are, they are all concentric circles of, of different elements. Now, as Yonatan ben Uziel's understanding, as the word Tarshish being descriptive, descriptive of the color of heaven, so what do you do about the word Tarshish, which seems to describe a heavenly color, not a terrestrial color? So the Rambam refers us to Uncleus's translation of that verse in Exodus chapter 24, when it says that beneath God's feet in their, in their uh, heavenly vision, they see a kema'ase livnata sapir. They see something that looks like sapphire brickwork. Their Uncleus, the other translator uh, into Aramaic, says ka'ovad even tava. It means that it was like stonework. This means that this crystalline substance represents the basing building block of all the elements. It represents prime matter, which is in the process of being formed and constructed when it is imbued with form. Um, and that's really what, what the vision that they were seeing atop Mount Sinai. Here too, this appearance of the Ofan is not referring to celestial bodies, but what they're viewing when it says Tarshish is this crystalline substance, which is this prime matter who lay in Greek. It refers to this unformed prime matter which emanates into our world and becomes eventually the four elements and then the four elements combine with each other and become complex structures now the rambam feels that a little bit guilty disagreeing with yonatan ben Uziel, and therefore he gives sort of like a disclaimer at the end of the chapter he says it's okay to disagree with yonatan ben Uziel, since many of our sages Many of the other Talmudic sages disagreed with Yonatan ben Uziel, especially in such esoteric matters. Now, even though the Rambam does not cite any rabbis who disagree with Yonatan ben Uziel in this particular case, the Rambam is basically saying, and this is a, a bit of a, uh, of a bold statement, when it comes to interpretation of esoteric scripture, I have license to disagree even with a Tana, Yonatan ben Uziel, if I feel that he's making a mistake in his depiction of the metaphysical realm. Because you're dealing with very esoteric matters, and it's possible that Yonatan ben Uziel did not have access to Aristotle. And based on that, he had a different way of viewing the text. But now that we have Aristotelian science, we can look at it differently. I think that's very revelatory to our endeavor of studying this medieval text of Morin of Uchim, because it basically says to us that we have a right to disagree with the Rambam. If we understand science differently and we don't use Aristotle as our basis for understanding the machinations and workings of our universe, then if we, if we go back and we reinterpret the verses from Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10, etc., and we look at them using uh, our knowledge of physics, quantum mechanics, and so forth, um, if we look at it that way, then, um, then we would have license to, to actually, oh, someone's, uh, someone's actually making markings on, on our screen. So please, uh, please stop doing that if you don't mind. But he basically says it's all right to disagree with Yonatan ben Uziel, as, uh, because uh, we have license to do so. And then he finally ends off by saying, moreover, and I'm just reading from the text on page 425, I'm not obliging you to decide in favor of my interpretation. If you think I'm wrong, and you think that there's a different, more correct reading, 
then you have a right to go with whatever reading you feel is going to provide a correct depiction of the metaphysical realm. Understand the whole of his interpretation from that to which I have drawn your attention and understand my interpretation. And basically, look, the Rambam's basically saying, use your own mind, look at his, his way of depicting it, look at the way I've depicted it, and decide for yourself which is more accurate from a scientific perspective. God knows in which of the two interpretations there is a correspondence to what has been intended. Okay, on that note, dear friends, I think we'll call it a day. We've gone through two chapters of the guide, and we will continue Bezrat Hashem next time. Uh, let me just see here. All right, hope to see you then. Everyone have a wonderful week, and we'll continue with chapters five and six, God willing, next time. Hopefully, we'll be able to do another two chapters of the Maasei Merkava, which concludes with chapter seven. Take care now, everyone.